it's Ollie Epsom. Um, welcome to part two of the Type 42 Propulsion System presentation. So today we're going to try and look at the rest of the system, which was to do with the gearbox, the controllable pitch propellers, and a couple of subsystems. We'll also look at this half line in a little bit more detail. Um, for those of you who haven't seen part one, uh, please see there's a link in the description to that. And in part one, we gave an introduction to what the Type 42 destroyer actually was. I'm assuming you've seen part one. So today we're just going to launch straight into the heavy technical detail. Um, I would try and encourage you to watch the whole thing, even if your intention span is as short as mine is at the moment because there'll be a lot of stuff in this presentation that you're not going to find anywhere else on the internet. Um, and it is increasingly difficult to find people who are old enough to remember how it works. Um, I might be one of the last ones. With that in mind, let's just get started. Hands to action stations, hands to action stations. Assume NBCD, state one, condition Zulu. Just as a quick recap, in part one we covered the following, which was an introduction to the Type 42 destroyer, um, the prime movers, which was the COGOG, or combined gas or gas layout, um, and we looked at the fuel consumption and performance. Um, if you can't uh, remember any of that, then there's a link in the description below to that uh, lecture, and you can go and have a look at it and remind yourself of those details. In this talk, we are going to look in more detail at the shaft line itself, and we're also going to look at gearboxes and clutches, although I'm not going to go in detail at all on the clutches today. I'm just going to tell you what they do. Really, it requires a, a lecture of their own to talk about how they work. Um, and we're going to look at the CPP, or Controllable Pitch Propeller System, which is what allowed these destroyers to change from the ahead to the astern direction without reversing the shaft. Um, here's a fuel sample. Uh, this picture was actually taken on my last day on Nottingham, just after we'd switched the engines off for the last time. Um, uh, on that day, friends and family could come and have a look around the ship when you went in and uh, had a couple of friends of mine, Alex here and uh, Susie came on board. Uh, and I was just showing them around the um, uh, machinery spaces. Uh, for some reason, Alex is holding a fuel sample. I can't imagine why, um, although of course we did have to keep the generators running for a long time, even though the main engines were switched off and those generators were probably running for I don't know, a couple of days until we got into our final berth and connected to shore supply. Uh, down here, you can see the man below tally system. So everybody had a tag in the department and you'd move the tag from here into the relevant hook for the relevant engine space. And that was how the chief of the watch knew who was below um, in the machinery spaces. And that was important for deciding whether or not to deploy the fire suppressant system in the event of an emergency. Also behind me here you see the switchboard controller. Um, I'm not going to go into the electrical system in this talk. Um, the electrical system on the Type 42s was fairly straightforward, but I managed to royally screw it up one day and end up with three generators running and no electricity anywhere, um, which uh, got me in a small amount of trouble. Uh, luckily, it was in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean, so we managed to sort it out without actually banging into anything. I remember the logistics officer whinging about having lost some power points he was uh, she was working on at the time. I pointed out that the uh, officer of the watch lost his steering motors and I didn't hear him whinging, but uh, hey ho, c'est la After that, I got given a little black chain to wear around my neck and uh, got a nickname of the Prince of Darkness, so how we chuckled. Anyway, let's get on. Here we have a very um, quick recap of the layout of the propulsion systems on the Type 42 destroyers. Again, what I'd ask you to do is maybe freeze this um, video at this point and have a look through this um, yourself if there's any items that you can't remember. But very briefly, we have two gas turbines per shaft, a large Olympus gas turbine and a small time gas turbine, and they each drive into a gearbox. 
and that gearbox diverts one or the other of those engines out to the propeller shaft which then runs through the ship and out to the back where we have a five bladed controllable pitch propeller um, the shaft is hollow throughout and there are many oil channels and pipes in there which we'll look at later the thrust from the propeller, which is of course what makes the ship move, is counteracted by the thrust block, which is in the main gearbox. And thus the main gearbox is bolted to the ship and the thrust from the propeller goes through the main gearbox and into the ship that way. There's also twin rudders uh, directly behind the propellers, which uh, combined with the controllable pitch propellers gave it very good maneuverability. Um, again, um, I'm not going to go into this in detail now. It was covered in a previous lecture, but feel free to pause the presentation and have a look at it. OK, let's look in a little bit more detail at the shaft line itself over the next two slides. Um, I'm going to read a couple of points and then I'll explain what we're looking at in these pictures. So, as I said, we've got two hollow shafts and each of those shafts penetrates three compartments internal to the ship before going through the stern seal and out to the propellers. The shaft support is by two plumber blocks. Plumber blocks are bearings which support the shaft in the vertical orientation to prevent it from sagging. They don't provide any lateral thrust resistance. That is done by the main gearbox, as I just said. The stern seals are of the ceramic face sealed water cooled design, um, which are really, really good. And they also have an inflatable emergency operation. Um, so if you do knacker your seals, you basically inflate an inner tube type thing and that will prevent some water ingress. Um, the advantage of the water lubricated type seal over the oil lubricated seal is you don't lose oil into the sea from lubricating the faces. Now, rest assured, we have, as you'll find out, plenty of other ways of feeding the dolphins on a Type 42 destroyer. So uh, don't labour under the misapprehension that we had water lubricated face sealed stern, tube, stern seals because we were environmentally friendly. OK, this photograph here shows the Let's remember now the starboard propeller shaft um, and we are looking forward. So this is the front of the ship bow that way and we are in the plumber block space at the rear of the ship. So just out of shot here behind us is the stern seal itself. And here is the flanged coupling, um, which we can see on the drawing here. Um, the big red unit here is the after plumber block, which on the map is here. And then the shaft goes through this bulkhead seal here into the after auxiliary machinery room, which we can see on the map here. Now, the idea of these bulkhead seals is that if a compartment is flooded, water won't flow from one to the other. Um, uh, limited efficacy in my experience. They do work a little bit, but they're not great. Uh, the plumber block here has a, a temperature sensor or temperature gauge rather on top of it and an oil filling cap. Um, out of shot here, there is a can of oil on the wall, like a 10 litre drum. And every so often you'd go along and top this oil up. Also, you can see some small tubes here. Those were seawater delivery tubes, which served to cool a plumber block in the event of it overheating. Um, in practice, I never actually saw that happen. And these valves were generally closed. Um, looking again at the map here, we can see that the other plumber block is in the after engine room where so much equipment is. And we also have a torsion meter on the shaft that allowed us to constantly monitor in real time how much torque there was on the shaft and avoid an over torque scenario. You'll notice that with these flanged couplings like the one in the picture that the shaft is actually in multiple sections and that is so that you can replace the shaft in parts. Um, in practice the most likely part of the shaft to be damaged is the part outside the ship which we're going to look at next. Okay, let's look at the external shaft line now. Um, again, I'm going to do the same thing. I'll read some points and then I'll explain what we're looking at. 
So the external shafts are supported by A and B brackets. So once they leave the ship, they go through the shaft tunnel here, which we can see on the map, which is outside in the water, but it's in a tunnel essentially, to these A brackets of which there are two. Now the A brackets are basically water lubricated bearings supported on structures that look like an A, so it's fairly self-explanatory. Uh, there's a shaft join which is done by an SKF oil injected coupling here um, which allows you to easily quote unquote remove the final shaft section. Um, there's a five bladed controllable pitch propeller at the end of each shaft and we have twin rudders as I already said. Now um, it's very difficult to get a picture of the propellers on a Type 42 destroyer because they're underwater most of the time. The best one I could find online, because I didn't have any for my own travels, was this one at the bottom, where they are slung after scrapping on a beach in Turkey. Um, as you can see, we've got one, two, three, four, five blades per propeller. This here is the remains of the after A bracket bearing, which we can see here on the map, and then we've got the rest of the shaft. Um, the SKF oil injected coupling is a fascinating um, piece of equipment, um, which is a really clever way of joining two shafts together using a sort of taper lock type um, arrangement similar to what you might find in a milling machine and using very high pressure oil injection to loosen that taper lock when you wish to disassemble the shaft. It's really clever. A Swiss invention. I believe it's from the 1930s and it's well worth looking up if you're interested in mechanical engineering in general. Um, the controllable pitch propellers we'll go into in a lot more detail later. Um, as I said, the primary advantage is that the shaft can keep spinning in the same direction, but the thrust can be reversed. As you can see, this is a really long and heavy shaft. I can't remember how much it weighs, but it's in the order of tens of tons. So stopping that shaft to reverse it would require an awful lot of kinetic energy to be dumped and then added in the other direction. And that takes a long time to do and limits your maneuverability. A disadvantage of CPPs is complexity, cost, and believe it or not, efficiency, because for various reasons, unlike aircraft, um, ships controllable pitch propellers are usually slightly less efficient than a non-controllable pitch propeller would be, um, which is why a lot of big cargo ships just have a standard, normal, non-adjustable propeller on them. OK, let's look at the fun stuff now. So we're going to spend a couple of slides looking at the gearbox. Now, the gearboxes on the Type 42s were works of art. Um, we'll go into them in the next slide as to who built them and why and how. Um, but first off, I'm just going to talk to you about some ratios and the general layout of the gearbox. The Tyne gas turbines rotate at a much higher speed than the Olympus gas turbines, even though they are lower powered. Um, in order to reduce the speed of the input from the Tyne gas turbine, the first thing there is is a primary gearbox um, which joins the Tyne to the input shaft for the main gearbox. That has a reduction ratio of 4.07 to 1. Next, we have a synchro self shifting or SSS clutch. The function of the SSS clutch is exactly the same as the function of a freewheel on a bicycle. They don't work like a freewheel on a bicycle because they have to handle a lot more torque, but that is what they do. So whichever engine, Tyne or Olympus, is providing the most oomph, the most torque, will overpower the other one and just like a freewheel on a bicycle when you start pedaling as soon as you start pedaling at the same speed that the wheel is going the freewheel bites when you stop pedaling the wheel keeps spinning it's exactly the same here so as soon as one of the engines is fueled up and matches the speed of the um gearbox then 
that clutch will clutch in. So you have to schedule the fuel system so that as one engine speeds up, the other one slows down. That's all there is to it. They don't work like a ratchet on a bicycle, but they do exactly the same function. And I just want to make that clear. The way they actually work is a bit more complicated and fascinating, but I'm not going to go into it in this lecture because it just takes too long. Once it goes through the clutch, we then get the main or the primary reduction in the main gearbox. So I'm going to call that B to C, and that is 4.135 to 1. We then get the secondary reduction, which is C to D, which is 5.2 to 1. Now, as you probably know, with gearboxes, the ratios multiply. So, for example, to keep the math simple, let's say A to B equals, call it 4 to 1. Uh, B to um, B to C equals approximately four to one, and C to D also equals about five to one. So if we multiply four times four times five, we're going to get four times four, which is sixteen times five. Um, we're going to get eighty to one. Now what we actually get is 87.87 to 1 because I have obviously simplified these figures. Um, so that is the Tyne. So what that means is for every one turn of the Rolls-Royce Tyne engine, you get 87, sorry, for every one, sorry, pardon me. For every 87.87 turns of the Tyne engine, we get one turn of the propeller shaft. Now, the Olympus does not have a primary gearbox, so that's a 21.59 to 1 reduction. And what that means is for every 21.59 um, revolutions of the Olympus, we get one revolution of the output shaft. Uh, so far, so straightforward. I've also mentioned here that there is a hand turning attachment that goes onto this gearbox and that has a 14,000 to 1 reduction. That is there primarily for maintenance so that you can slowly rotate the shaft tooth by tooth for inspections. Um, but it also serves a secondary purpose, which is to actually lock the gearbox when we need to lock a shaft. Now, to do that, we clutch in the primary gearbox and the reduction, sorry, we clutch in the hand turning gearbox and the reduction ratio is so large that it actually prevents the gearbox from being turned any other way. Um, because that's quite a dangerous situation to be in if you're about to start an engine, the clutch handle for the hand turning gearbox rests in a special tray in the after engine room and that tray has a switch in it and that switch is interlocked with the gas turbine start sequences so you won't actually be able to start a gas turbine without the clutch in the clutch handle unless you override the interlocks which you would only do at war right what we see here on the top right is not a type 42 gearbox but it is a double helical gearbox that i found online and it's as good a photo as any um, to demonstrate what i'm about to describe i don't have the photo of the inside of a type 42 gearbox for a couple of reasons one i never dismantled one and two um, when you remove the inspection covers, you really can't see very much. You almost need to see it back in the factory under overhaul to be able to get an appreciation that is any better than this simple drawing that we have here. Again, I'm going to read a few points out to you and then I'm going to explain what they mean. So each gearbox is 35 tons all in. Um, which actually isn't a lot when you consider that the ship itself is 4,500 to 5,500 tons. Um, obviously, we've got two gearboxes, so that's 70 tons of gearbox. And as I said before, the gearboxes via the main thrust collar here um, transmit the thrust of the propellers into the ship, thereby making it move. Each gearbox is double reduction, although, as I said, they're kind of triple reduction, really, because we've got the time primary gearbox on top of that. Dual tandem, articulated, locked train, double helical with synchro self-shifting clutches, force lubricated, motor driven, force lubrication and gear driven force lubrication pumps. And they are made by David Brown. Now. 
A lot of that might not mean a lot to you, so let's um, explain what I mean. First off, double reduction I think is fairly straightforward, and I think I explained it in the previous slide relatively well. Um, ignoring the primary gearbox uh, for the second, double reduction simply means that we've got two reduction stages. So we've got from here to here is one stage of reduction, and then from here to here is another stage of reduction. In the gearbox we see on this picture, it appears that we only have one stage of reduction, which is from here to here. There may well be other stages, but you can't see them in this picture. Dual tandem is a bit more complicated, and that is a feature of these gearboxes that I like a lot. Dual tandem means that the intermediate stage that is between the first and second sets of reduction which are these shafts here there's two of them normally on a gearbox you'd only have one so what that means is usually you drive from here to here and then from here to here but um, on this gearbox it's a dual system so we've got two uh, intermediate shafts now the advantage of that is that the load is shared between two shafts which means that the teeth are only doing half the work. They're only subjected to half the forces that they would usually be because it's shared between two um, sets. Uh, the disadvantage is you need twice as many gears, um, but a dual tandem system um, reduces the weight of your gearbox and it improves the smoothness and longevity of it. And it's a really nice system um, that you do see in a lot of high-end gearboxes. Articulated. So this gearbox is mounted on a flexible ship and the ship flexes, it twists, it turns, it buckles, it bends, um, particularly the Type 42s, which were flexible in their own right. Because the ship is moving and the gearbox is bolted to the ship, that means the gearbox is also going to move. Now, it don't get me wrong, it's not going to move like millimetres in either direction, but it will twist and turn a little bit. Um, the gearbox has to be able to handle that. And to do that on all these intermediate shafts, and again, you can't see it in this drawing, but there's arrangements of splines, which are slightly flexible. And that allows the gearbox to move in and out a little bit and slightly twist in and out of alignment and flex with the ship. Um, it's a really clever refinement that uh, marks these gearboxes out as very, very high specification units. And that's why they worked for a long time. The locked train is a feature of the um, dual tandem design. It just means that you don't have backlash because the two intermediate shafts are arranged in such a way that they counterbalance the backlash in each other so that they don't flip around like that. That's what the locked train system means. Uh, double helical is one of the reasons I put this picture up. This is a double helical gear. So a helical gear is a gear where instead of the teeth being cut straight, which means parallel to the shaft, they're cut at an angle to the shaft. Now, the huge advantage of helical gearing is smooth running, because what happens with a straight cut spur gear, as one tooth engages, uh, the other disengages and that happens in an instant like in a, a fraction of a second so all of the load goes from one tooth to the other almost instantly and that gives you quite a lot of noise and quite a lot of wear and tear and it, it subjects the gearbox to some very harsh conditions with a helical gearbox where the teeth are cut diagonally you don't get that sudden transfer from one tooth to the other it happens slowly because the teeth are at an angle um, so you get a system where more than one set of tooth teeth are engaged at the same time because they're angled down the shaft that means you get a much smoother transmission of power and it's much quieter so in your car for example all of your forward gears use helical gears but your reverse gear does not because it's a cheap gear that you only use for a fraction of the time that you use the forward gears and that's why in every car in the world when you reverse it goes it's because it's got a spur gear with straight cut teeth rather than the helical gears of the forward now the disadvantage of a helical gear is that because the teeth are angled when the gears mesh you're essentially getting two inclined planes pushing down on each other which means they want to slide apart 
Therefore, you always need a thrust bearing, um, which just is a bit of a pain in the ass and adds to the mess that is the gearbox. Now, with a dual helical, you have essentially two gears ganged together with the teeth in a herringbone pattern, um, which means that there is no sideways thrust because the sideways thrust from one set of teeth is counterbalanced exactly by the sideways thrust from the other. Um, so a dual helical system gives you the advantages of a helical gear, which is quiet and smooth running with long life, and the advantages of a straight cut spur gear, which is no need for a thrust bearing. Um, the disadvantage of a dual helical setup is that it's much more expensive to make. But again, these gearboxes on the Type 42s were very high specification, so they went for a no messing about um, double helical system, even on the relatively low torque primary gearbox from the Tyne, uh, where they could, to my mind, easily have got away with a straightforward single helical system. Uh, later ships in the Royal Navy cheaped out. I'm thinking specifically of the Type 23 frigates. Uh, and the gearboxes on those did have serious issues and, in fact, um, were power limited for their entire life, um, which was a bit of an embarrassment in my mind. Um, SSS clutches I've already mentioned, um, and I don't really want to talk about them too much more. Force lubricated, so obviously with these gearboxes you need to keep the oil flowing all the time. The entire inside of the gearbox had oil sprayers which splattered oil around, um, and that oil just had to flow. I mean, if these things went more than one or two turns dry, you would pretty much destroy the um, case hardening, the face hardening on the teeth. Um, so because lubrication is so important, it had two pumps, one driven by the motor, electric motor, and one driven by the gearbox itself. Um, when the ships were first developed, um, the idea was that we'd turn off the motor driven pumps and just run around on the gear driven pumps. Um, there were automatic cut-ins on the motor driven pumps for when the shaft speed dropped below 80 shaft RPM, which was the threshold for what the gear driven pumps could cope with. Um, in practice, by the time I served, we just ran around with the motor driven pumps and the gear driven pumps running in parallel all the time. Um, in addition, for real emergencies, on top of the motor driven pump, there was an air motor, which was the air driven lube oil pump. And that had the capability, I think, to provide oil for about 20 minutes. Um, so if you were having a really bad day and you had a total electrical failure and you couldn't move anything, but you just needed to keep oil in the gearbox, you could do that for a very short amount of time. Um, the reason I mentioned David Brown is you may or may not know, David Brown was a big industrial company back in the day when the UK used to actually produce pretty good quality equipment. Um, it was famous for making gearboxes, tractors and so on. Um, Many people know it as the owner of the luxury car brand Aston Martin, and that's why James Bond's car, the DB5, um, was called DB5 because it was an Aston Martin DB5 and the DB stood for David Brown. And that is still the case today with uh, Aston Martins. They still maintain that nomenclature. So there you go. A little bit of trivia for you there. So speaking of the lubrication system, it does exist. Um, I'm not going to go into a great deal of detail. Feel free to pause this slide and just look through the diagram um, in your own time if you'd like. Um, these were my notes that I made myself at the time. Um, as I said, though, there is an oil system and each gearbox is separate. So a key point is that in the event of an emergency, you can cross connect the two lubrication systems by opening valve 229, 228 and 289. Those valves are only to be opened with permission of the marine engineering officer. Um, and I've obviously never done it. I mean, it's pretty obvious if you've got crap in one system and you cross connect it to the other, then you've got crap in both systems. Um, so yeah, those valves are only used in an emergency. It's also worth pointing out that they're a pig to find. I would not be able to find them if I was on a Type 42 today. I remember when I first went looking for them, they were all over the shop and they definitely were not all in the same place. One of them was, you know, in a toilet somewhere. I mean, it wasn't, but it was that kind of thing. It's certainly not easy to find. Um, also, as I said, trying to avoid going down too much of a rabbit hole here because 
the purpose of displaying this diagram is to display some of the interconnectedness of all the systems. So by having a gearbox, we then have a forced lubrication system. By having a forced lubrication system, we need an electrical system to power it. So these uh, figures here are the breakers and the automatic changeover switches that power the port and starboard um, motor driven force lubrication pumps we also have oil therefore it needs to be heated so we heat it from steam from the separators we need filters um, which are here and we need coolers those coolers are connected to a cooling salt water system and so on and so on and so on so very quickly we get a quite complex system um, that takes a while to get your head round. here's a picture of the port gearbox on HMS Nottingham. It's difficult to get a picture of the whole gearbox because of all the crap that's shoved around it, but we can see some key features. The manual turning gear is this box here, which consists of a worm gearbox and a couple of other reduction stages in there to give us that 14,000 to one overall reduction system. Um, we have uh, sump heaters, electric sump heaters in the gearbox, which are not the same as the steam heaters in the drain tank. And those sump heaters are powered by a three phase from the ship's main electrical system, which enters via this box here. We've got uh, many thermocouples in there on bearings and so forth, mainly to detect if a bearing's wiped, um, which is a very, very subtle rise in temperatures. These things use white metal bearings, which is essentially um, solder. Um, so if you think about the temperature at which solder melts, that could happen in a gearbox. So all of those temperature sensors came out of this box and went off um, to the control room and to the local temperature gauges, which we see here. Um, we have in the corner here the SSS clutch panel local override for the time. Um, that basically allows you to lock the tyne out and there's another one for the Olympus which is out of shot. So for maintenance or emergencies or because of faulty equipment if you want to stop those things from clutching in that's what you can do. Um, it's a bit tricky and you have to mess around with oil. Um, I've never done it but I've seen it done so consider me a bit of a eunuch in that regard. Um, it's pretty easy to destroy stuff if you use these equipment incorrectly so generally we got somebody who really knew what they were doing like Chief Dunthorne or P.O. Hart to sort it out. Here we see the replacement of a motor driven forced lubrication pump motor. We did this in, in um, Gibraltar. This photo I took at about two o'clock in the morning. Um, you can see one of my colleagues here um, who's had to crawl into what we called the snake pit, which was just an absolute mass of pipes, cables, everything else in between the two gearboxes. It's a horrible place down there. I mean, you, you would not have been able to escape in an emergency very quickly. Um, we had to sling this 300 kilo motor all the way down the ship, which is why it took till two in the morning. Um, it's absolute pig of a job to do. Um, and I'm really demonstrating this photo as a means of explaining what life was like for the technicians and fitters on those ships. Um, it was not necessarily glamorous and exciting. Um, although it could also be quite rewarding. So um, yeah, and you, I certainly learned a hell of a lot from that kind of work. Um, I can't remember who was holding these chains and whose foot this is, but I do know that that's POMEA Ticker Hart um, here, uh, whose other claim to fame was being an excellent bass guitarist, uh, which he still does. So enough about the gearbox, let's look at the CPP system. So first off, I wanna say what is a CPP system for those of you who may not be that aware of them. CPP system stands for controllable pitch propellers. It means that the shafts always turn in the same direction without um, having to be stopped and reversed in order to reverse the thrust. On the, in the case of the Type 42s, the shafts turned inwards. And what that means is if we look at the stern of the ship, the shafts turned this way. So that's the stern of the ship. And, you know, let's put a little helicopter hanger on it or something and a little funnel. 
and we're looking at the back of the ship and the shafts would turn in that direction and they always turned in that direction no matter which direction the ship was going in no matter whether it was going forwards or backwards um, the shafts always turned in the same direction in this case inward you get some ships where they turn outward but these turned inward uh, the propeller pitch can be varied from full ahead to full astern to alter the ship's direction. And the powered shafts turn at a minimum of 50 shaft RPM. What that means is under normal circumstances, when you've got a turbine running, the shafts are always spinning at 50 shaft RPM, regardless of what you're doing. And the main reason for that is to maintain hydrodynamic lubrication on all the bearings throughout the shaft. So not just the internal ones like the plumber blocks and the gearbox itself, but also the external ones at the A&P brackets. Um, because if you start turning slower than that, then you're not lubricating the bearings and that would damage them. Pitch can be reduced to zero to yield. That should be reduced to zero. Sorry, uh, to yield zero thrust uh, while the shaft continue to spin. That is a really bad typo. I do apologize. Um, yeah, so what that means is essentially what I've already said that you can keep the shaft spinning with zero pitch and you won't get any thrust forward or back. So if we look at the general concepts of the CPP system um, I just want to say that there were at least three different types of CPP system fitted to the various type 42 destroyers. So the batch ones had the mark one system um, which I'm not actually familiar with because I've never used it. Um, the Batch twos and Manchester and Gloucester, which were batch threes, had the system that I'm about to describe here. Um, now, this system, all the systems were hydraulically accurated, but I've just left that in there anyway. Um, hydraulic pressure from motor and gear driven variable displacement pumps was used. So that gearbox that we looked at, as well as driving the forced lubrication pumps, also drove a gear driven CPP pump with variable displacement, which we shall examine in a minute. And the system is designed, and this is absolutely key point, to ensure recirculation of oil to avoid in shaft condensation. Now that may sound like a throwaway line, but it's fundamental to the entire reason that the system I'm about to describe is the way it is. And it is very complicated. What that means is that it's constantly trying to make sure that oil doesn't sit in the shaft for a long time, because if it does, it's gonna get wet from oil leaking in through the hub and so on, sorry, from water leaking in from the hub and so on and so forth. And then you're gonna get condensation, which will lead to internal rusting in the shaft. Now, as it turned out, operational experience with these CPP systems indicated that shaft condensation wasn't actually gonna be a problem. And so Edinburgh and York, which were the last two batch threes, had a much simplified system, which I'm also not familiar with, um, but I do know that it existed. So we're going to concentrate on the type two system because that's the one I'm familiar with. And it was obviously fitted on the old D91 um, HMS Nottingham. So let's take a look at that. So in trying to figure out how to best explain the CPP system, I've decided to go backwards from the propeller to the oil transfer box at the front of the gearbox rather than the other way around. Um, what we see on this picture up here is not a Type 42 controllable pitch propeller because again, it's difficult to find a picture of them and I don't have any, but it is a controllable pitch propeller with five blades. Um, and I've left that up there just to give you an indication of what we're actually looking at. So each of these blades can swivel on the hub. Now, what we have here on the left, uh, again, feel free to pause this and read each line if you would like. Um, but what it is, is the hub of a Type 42 controllable pitch propeller system. Um, I'm just going to bring up these two points and then I'll go through it quickly. In the hub itself, we have a piston and cylinder arrangement. And as a piston and cylinder move under the application of hydraulic pressure, the blades rotate. And those blades rotate because they're connected to these crank pins, um, which fit into sliding shoes, which fit into the piston cylinder arrangement. So the piston and the cylinder both move. OK, and we'll see a bit more how in a minute. Note, um, 
that the oil is fed into the hub by means of concentric tubes within the propeller shaft itself and that oil is pressurized now one of these oil tubes um, which is the outside one is fixed to the piston itself and what that means is that the piston which moves backwards and forwards is rigidly connected to its supply pipe and therefore its supply pipe moves backwards and forwards and that supply pipe goes all the way to the other end of the propeller shaft to the oil transfer box which we will look at shortly and that is what provides pitch feedback to the control system so we know what pitch the propeller is at because we are directly connected to the piston in the hub of the um, propeller that is a, a kind of key point that i want to bring up here if we look further at the inside of the hub um, we've removed the hub itself so the hubs are sort of on the outside of here and we just look at the piston cylinder arrangement remember that the cylinder and the piston both move and the they're sort of connected in a kind of offset star arrangement as you can see here from this immaculate coloring in that I did and so this section moves that way for example and this section moves that way and that makes them move um, in relation to each other the sliding shoes are dragged along with them and those sliding shoes fit into the crank pins on the propeller blade itself and that is how the propeller blade swivels um, so the piston and the cylinder by virtue of the fact that they're connected to the propeller blade are forced to move um, opposite to each other um, they can't float relative to the entire hub they can only float relative to each other a second point that i need to make here um, is that the shaft diameter on the right hand side is larger than the shaft diameter on the left hand side what i mean is here in blue we have the piston shaft now note that in here the piston shaft is big whereas in here on this side it is small and what that means and this is really important is that less oil is needed to push the cylinder to the left which is this way than to the right which is obviously this way and that is fundamental to how this system ensures that every time you change pitch more oil is shoved around the system so every time you activate it because of this difference in volume between moving the pitch one way and moving it the other oil is shoved around the system it's really simple but it's important and that's what but the rest of it is not so simple as we'll see going right the way to the other end of the propeller shaft we have the oil transfer box um so inside the propeller shaft itself we have those concentric pressurized oil tubes which deliver pressurized oil to the propeller hub which alters the pitch the oil transfer box is mounted on the forward end of the gearbox right in front of the propeller shaft so looking again at the gearbox diagram um it's essentially here so we go the the, the shaft goes right through the gearbox and out to the other end and that is where the oil transfer box is the job of the oil transfer box is to get pressurized oil from the stationary hydraulic system into the rotating shaft um, which it does by a system of face seals and orifices so as well as a head and a stern lines um, which we have here in blue again with my own fair hand um, we also have face seal cooling lines which are these red lines here and we also have these two green lines which are what is called hub pressurization oil now hub pressurization oil is um, gravity fed into the shaft and what that does is it maintains a constant albeit very low pressure of oil in the shaft which slowly leaks out uh, from holes in the hub and it keeps water out of the shaft um, 
and it obviously feeds the dolphins. So remember what I said about oil shaft seals, where we pump the equivalent amount of oil into the sea by the hub pressurization system. Um, the reason there's two of them is because originally one of them was for air. There used to be a system called the Agouti air system, um, which blew pressurized air into the um, shaft and out through little holes in the propeller itself. The idea of that was to somehow magically reduce the noise produced by the pro propeller. In practice, it either didn't work or it didn't work well enough to justify continued maintenance. And by the time I was on these ships, that had been replaced and we just blew oil down there instead. Again, feel free to uh, pause this if you would like. OK, here is the map of the system for the ships uh, listed above, which we've already said. I'm not going to go into this in detail. Um, please feel free to pause the presentation and look at this slide in greater detail if you'd like. And if you'd like me to make a presentation explicitly about this, I will do so. Just fling it in the comments below. It will, however, require me to try and figure out the complexity of the composite valve block, which my notes are not actually that good at. So hence why I'm slightly glossing over it. Uh, it had complex bidirectional hydraulics based on twin variable displacement swash plate pumps, which I'll describe in a minute. And oil was made up from and rejected to eventually the header tank, which is up here. And what I mean by that is on a standard hydraulic system, everything goes back to a drain tank. So when you pressurize a piston to move one way, you're going to get oil at the other end, which needs to come back and go somewhere. And that is generally just vented straight back to the drain tank. Now, that doesn't happen on this system. Here we're using twin variable displacement pumps, one driven directly by the gearbox and one driven by an electric motor. What happens here is that the suction and discharge of the pumps are essentially the same because the pumps are variable displacement. They can pump either way. So they either pump this way, in which case they suck this way, or they do the reverse. They pump this uh, pump this way and suck that way. Um, that means that on a normal day, the oil is the same oil in the entire line. It doesn't go to the tank or it would not go back to the tank if there wasn't this displacement issue between requiring one extra gallon of oil to go from full astern to full ahead versus from full ahead to full astern. So in order to cope with that oil recirculation feature, we have the composite valve block here. Um, and what that does is through a system of dump valves, it relieves excess oil pressure back ultimately into the header tank, but via the drain tank by these pipes um, so that when you're going from a head to a stern, that extra gallon of oil is vented out. Um, in order to make it up again when going the other way, each of these pumps has a small fixed displacement gear pump co-located on the drive axle and driven by the same motor. And that constantly supplies pressure. From memory, I think it's um, 600 PSI, I believe. Um, and that boost pump pressure in the composite valve block is used to make up that additional oil that is required to go from a stern to a head. So from a stern to a head, the boost pump provides the extra oil. And from a head to a stern, the dump valves get rid of the extra oil. And that is generally speaking how it works. Um, the actual demand for oil is done by the pitch control electronics and the feedback is taken from the movement of the oil sh oil pipe itself in the oil transfer box that I described before. And that pitch uh, control system provides a demand to the variable displacement pumps, which we'll look at in a minute. If this entire system craps out, I mean, it's hard to believe that it would really, given how complicated it is. Um, you do have the facility to plug instantaneous oil connections into the oil transfer box area from either hand pumps or as far as I can remember, the ship's hydraulic system as well. 
Um, but if you are operating in that mode, you only have the option to go full ahead or full astern because you don't, you can't really tease the shaft to go anywhere else um, because of, well, a lot of reasons really, mainly to do with oil leakage. The CPP system pump, uh, whether it's motor driven or gear driven, they're both similar. They're both um, variable displacement swash plate pumps. Um, and again, feel free to pause this and look at it in more detail. Um, a swash plate pump consists of a rotating barrel, which always spins constantly, and a tiltable swash plate at the end, which has the facility to rotate um, at 90 degrees to the main axis of rotation of the barrel. What that means is that when the swash plate is at, at zero, then these pistons, which are, it is connected to, do not move backwards and forwards throughout the rotation of the barrel, and therefore no oil is pumped. However, the more you tilt the swash plate, the more the pistons move and the more oil is pumped. So, and also, if you push the swash plate the other way, the oil is pumped the other way. And that is how a variable displacement swash plate pump is able to suck and blow from either pipe, as we see at the bottom here. That is because of a thing called a valve plate or port plate, which is nothing much more complicated than what we see here. It's basically two C-shaped slots, which slide against the barrel and only let oil in or out when the pistons are in that position. Obviously, this whole thing is a highly precision engineered piece of equipment because to get the pressures needed, all the sliding parts, of which there are many, need to be very, very smooth and very well manufactured and constantly immersed in oil, which has to be spotlessly clean. But once you've got all that right, it does work and they work very well. In order to tilt the swash plate, we have a servo piston assembly, um, which acts on a piston which is connected to the swash plate itself, and that's what tilts it backwards and forwards. Now, the angle of that um, servo piston is demanded by the CPP control electronics, and then set with a servo system, which is in here. Um, you can manually override it locally. And again, that's something we used to do when we had power and pitch failure um, drills. But again, it was quite complicated and it wasn't for the faint hearted. As I said, there's also a small gear driven boost pump co-located on the shaft, um, which provides that excess makeup pressure. Um, the whole thing is driven through the drive shaft, which is either motor driven or gear driven at the other end. And you have to take a lot of care with these. Um, these pumps are sensitive, expensive pieces of equipment. But I have to say, we didn't have any problems um, with them. The one thing that I used to hear about a lot, and I've never experienced it, is this port plate in red, which is the same as this valve plate here in this simpler drawing. Um, there was talk of a thing called port plate liftoff, which I didn't really ever understand, but apparently it was bad. And in order to avoid port plate liftoff, um, we had cross connection valves on the boost pumps. And I can't really remember any more than that, but I do remember that controlling the cross connection valves between the motor driven and the gear driven boost pumps was very important. I just can't remember why. So if any of you can remember, please correct me in the, in the comments below. Uh, I think I've said all that, haven't I? Yep. Yep. Okay. Here is an additional picture of the snake pit, um, just for your enjoyment. This is the starboard gearbox roof here, and this is the starboard side of the ship. Down here, we've got various fuel systems, uh, fuel cleaning systems. There are some CPP pipes down there, and the oil transfer box is out of view underneath here. Uh, this here is the main starboard um, forced lubrication cooling system. Um, and there's a salt water pump under there, which is driven by the gearbox, which provides salt water, I believe through this pipe here actually, to the cooler up here. 
Um, other things we've got are a couple of HB Air bottles up on the top right of the image. They were mainly used for engine starting and um, uh, firefighting. And we've got a lot of fuel pipes and other bits and bobs um, scattered around. So you can see it's a real veritable mess and it was very difficult to trace all these systems um, when I was learning. I'm not going to go into any detail about the actual control system, but I will mention that controls existed and were a major part of the ship. So for the pitch and power control, um, the bridge, the machinery control room and local control was possible. So local control is literally one person on the engine controlling the speed of the engine and one person on the CPP pump altering the servo lever to get uh, local pitch control. Usually, um, if we had both shafts powered, the bridge would control the entire thing. Um, and they had two levers which were identical to the levers we see in this picture, which is the machinery control room. Um, and the whole system was integrated. So you basically pushed the power pitch control lever and the electronics, which are all analog, um, fueled up the gas turbines and altered the pitch as required. The machinery control room and local control was available for everything else. So the only things that the bridge could control was the actual power and pitch. Um, they couldn't, for example, start an engine. They couldn't select an engine. They couldn't stop an engine. Um, they couldn't transfer fuel or anything like that. That all had to be done from the machinery control room. The only thing they could do was alter the power and pitch. And even then, we had to select the um, bridge control to allow them to do that using this switch here in the middle. Uh, everything was analog. Uh, none of this was um, digital electronics. Um, so behind these panels that you see here um, were lots of cube like pieces of electronics. There were differentiators, integrators, adders and so on and so forth and gates um, that basically took all of the control inputs from the various switches and decided what to do about them. Um, again, I'll talk about that a bit more in future. Um, if anyone's actually interested in this picture, this was like the main engine control panel where we've got a uh, Tyne and Olympus start stop monitoring for the starboard engines. And just out of shot here on a port, we've got the same for the port engines. Uh, we've got the pitch power controllers in the middle. And here we have a, a microphone for talking to the engine spaces. Um, here we have the con microphone, which is to speak directly to the bridge. In the center, we've got the speedometer. We're doing 12.8 knots there. I don't know if that will come out in the video. And I know that we've got one tine on, which is the port tine, and we are trailing the starboard shaft. And the reason I know that is because I can see the telegraph here where he's got half a head on the port shaft and the starboard shaft has got nothing demanded. Um, you can also see the trailing. You can see here the starboard shaft is trailing at about 60 shaft RPM and the port shaft is going at about 120. Um, in the center here, you've got a main thermometer and all of those thermocouples that we saw connected to the main gearboxes come up on these um, buttons. So if the temperature is exceeded its limits, these buttons will light up and you'll get an alarm and you can actually read the temperature by pressing that button and it'll come up on the middle. Um, we've got the rudder position indicator in the center line. We obviously have a clock and we have main propeller pitch, uh, FL system pressure and controllable pitch propeller systems pressures uh, for port and starboard shaft. The boost crump cross connection valves are these plastic indicators. As I said, they need to be shut when operating and open when trailing. I cannot remember why. 
Um, and we also have um, various other pumps um, that we can start and stop and um, the main information. Down here, these two switches are for selecting either the Tyne or the Olympus on the port or starboard shaft. And you have to have a special qualification to actually use the selector switch, which I remember being very proud of when I first got it. Um, and by selecting an engine, the electronics behind will automatically ramp down one engine and ramp up the other. And you'll see the SSS clutch indicators um, do what they do, um, which I vague, can't remember where that's indicated, but it's up here. I think it might be um, here, possibly. I actually can't remember, but somewhere on the panel, there's an indicator for that. Um, these central controls are to take MCR control of the engines and the CPP if local control has been taken. So, for example, if you've had an incident or you're training and you've taken local control of it, we can um, regain MCR control by these buttons, um, which I've done a couple of times as well. But uh, again, it's uh, quite a deep topic and I think we'd we'd be better off talking about that later since we've already talked for a long time today. So I'm going to end it there and I'm just going to give you a summary, which is that Type 42 destroyers had a powerful and flexible propulsion system. And I think you've seen that, you know, the intricacy of the system, um, I hope, has sort of rubbed off on you throughout this presentation. Um, they were very well built with really top spec equipment that was quite redundant and they lasted a long time. Now, you all have seen um, in these pictures that I took that everything looked, not to put too fine a point on it, shagged. And it was. Um, it had been abused for 30 plus years and there really wasn't much of a maintenance budget. Um, we could do cosmetic painting, but to actually, you know, clean all the salt off, grind everything back to white metal, completely rebuild it. That wasn't really something that we were able to do because we were too busy running a warship. Um, also, the fact that the ships were being retired, they'd been left to, you know, to, to wither a bit before they died. But it's not fair to say that they were bad ships. They, they were good ships. Um, but on the other hand, they were also thirsty, um, complicated, noisy and really cramped. I should have really emphasised that. Um, and that really led to increasing operating costs. And, you know, the writing was on the wall really by the early 2000s for these ships. Um, at the time, we all complained about these ships. We whinged about how cramped they were, how dirty they were, how they broke down a lot, how everything was difficult and they were obsolete, obsolete we would always say. Um, because at the time we were being promised the new and improved uh, Type 45 destroyers, which were gonna be incredible and the bee's knees and the best of everything. And we were gonna get like eight or nine or 10 of them. In the end, we got like six Type 45 destroyers and one of them um, is constantly tied up or last time I checked was tied up at Portsmouth as a training vessel, um, which, you know, really kind of goes to show that we went from having 12 destroyers that admittedly were old, obsolete and, you know, expensive, but could still fight a war um, to having six on paper, much more capable type 45s. Um, but you can't have them in 12 places at once. And one of them always seems to be alongside. And we're having to do very expensive modifications to them, which are actually going to cut into the crew space in some instances in order to make the damn things work. So. In light of that, it's forced me to sort of reassess the Type 42s and actually go, you know what, they were pretty good ships. Um, with that, um, I'd really like to say thanks again for watching. And if you've got any questions or comments, please put them in the description below. Thank you for your patience and good day. OK, thank you very much for watching. Uh, that was part two of the Type 42 propulsion system. Uh, lectures that I've been making and I really do hope you enjoy it. Um, that concludes the propulsion system section of these lectures but depending on feedback I get from people I may make more lectures on other aspects of the Type 42 mechanical systems. 
Again, thank you so much for watching. I very much appreciate it. And I really hope you enjoyed watching it as much as I enjoyed rifling through dusty bookshelves up in my attic, uh, trying to refresh my memory in order to make it. It certainly was a bit of fun for me in these really tedious COVID splattered times. So thanks very much and enjoy the rest of your day.